If you're here, you already sense there's something out there, something magical and mysterious, just waiting for you to find. And you've probably already discovered it isn't as easy as just thinking happy thoughts. You're not alone. Generations of shamans, philosophers, seers, and scientists have pursued this eternal quest. Where their ideas come together, you'll find powerful tools to cultivate magic and self-mastery in your own life. Welcome to the Magic and Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Donna Woodwell. I'm a former journalist, an author, a master astrologer, and a hermetic initiate, and it's my honor to be your guide. In each episode, I'll meet you at the crossroads of science and spirit, reason and intuition to help you discover the wisdom that works for you. Are you ready? The adventure awaits. And welcome back to Magic and Mastery. I'm your host, Donna Woodwell, here with my co-host, Chris Kaplan. This is episode 20 about dream work. So Chris, I'm really excited. We're here in between eclipses in this, what's a place between? In between space? A crossroads. Place? Crossroads space. <laughs> the land betwixt in between. We thought it'd be the perfect time to talk a little bit about dreams and what they mean for our lives, how we can tune into their power and all the other good stuff. So before we get started, why don't you make sure you dive on over to the show notes if you want to find all the references and other goodies that we talk about in this show. And that's www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast. All right, Chris. Dreams. Dreams. <laughs> I know you and I have both wanted to do this show for a while. I feel like we're both holding up our cards. Who gets to start showing them first? <laughs> do you want to start on the conversation of what draws you to working with your dreams? Yeah, of course. And hey, Donna, it's great to see you and be back here with you. And yeah, these eclipses are wild right after a solar flare season two. So it does feel very fitting to be talking about dreams and especially with Jupiter moving into Pisces as well. We're definitely swimming in those seas. And and I feel like it's important when we're going through eclipse seasons and, and there are solar flares and there's a sort of all this subtle activity going on to um, kind of shut down the body and listen to the dreams, let things kind of defrag and, and just kind of process because... That's um, you know, the important phase, like the important work of dreams itself, uh, the, even just the biological and and psychological process that uh, kind of occurs when you go to sleep. It's super important and underappreciated in our culture, don't you think? Absolutely. I find that it's fascinating that dreams are the one place where science and mysticism recognize their crucial importance. And they may talk about it in a different way, but anyone at a sleep lab is totally on board with the fact that our minds need to dream for biological reasons, for psychological reasons. Anyone on the mystical trail would consider it our connection to spirit, also an essential food for our organism. And, you know, it's really rare that you ever get the Sciencey folks and the hippie folks get together and agree on something, at least in theory. Yeah, it totally is true. And I love how you brought up that bridge between science and spirit. And it's, it's absolutely those uh, nexus moments, you know, like the crossroads that we are currently in. And that, those are the, the points of connection that kind of unfurl. Like you have those two avenues meeting together and then they converge. And then you create that beautiful flower of life image that we get. And all those <laughs> beautiful sacred ge geometric proportions and stuff. It feels like that is the realm of this abstract dream consciousness. Yeah. I, I have heard one translation of the word shaman is mm. one who dreams or the one who dreams for the village, more precisely. I like that. And I know it was an essential part of my own shamanic training. You know, we sat, you know, every Friday night, trek out to um, the hill country, sit in my teacher's living room, working in ceremonial circles. But when you're consciously entering that space for ceremony, it's not that different from 
working with your dreams. And to the Native American tribe that my teacher lived with for a decade, uh, dreams were considered, well, the closest white people ever got to spirit because our, our mundane consensus reality religions where you go and sit and read something from a book and then go home once a week yeah. is more of an intellectual exercise than it is an actual encounter with a deeper kind of spirit. And so for the tribe, just like for other indigenous cultures or the Tibetan culture, other places, working with, with dreams was like practice for navigating the spirit world, specifically after you die and you don't have yeah. a body anymore. And so it became essential to learn how to wake up while you are asleep. So it's not quite the same you know, modern psychological folks on dreaming may be concerned with you know, whether you reach REM state or what right. your brain frequency is. Psych the psychologist might be concerned with what the images mean. You know, is the cigar just a cigar? Is it something else? Um, but those weren't the main concerns. The main concerns were, can you imagine your body? Can you see your hands? Can you mm -hmm. have some agency? In other words, can you become lucid in the process? Because that's what was strengthening the muscles that you would need to navigate the afterlife, the bardo, as the Tibetans would call it, with intention and purpose. Yeah. So we spent, we spent time having ceremonies to be able to develop our dream muscles. We spent time talking about uh, the different kinds of dreams, you know, how dream energy manifests, what happens when you start double dreaming, which some people fall into. It's like when you're dreaming that you're dreaming. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, yeah. Those are always and fun. those kinds of things and what they meant. And the closest person I've ever come to what I learned with uh, my shamanic teacher is Robert Moss, uh, mm -hmm. who went around and studied all the indigenous cultures. So that was at least going in the same direction that we were going in. So when I read this stuff, I'm like, oh, wow, it's not just us. <laughs> oh, now yeah. I have a point of contact with the rest of the world. <laughs> exactly. Robert Moss is great. I love his uh, Dreaming the Soul Back Home. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a great book for actually if you're having any sort of soul loss and how you can actually use dream states to kind of do soul retrievals. But then Carlos Castaneda, too, uh, is Art of Dreaming is a phenomenal book. And that technique, uh, that's like always the first sort of initiatory sort of practice you have to do is look at your hands try to become aware of your because then it's also the it's the connection between your body and then that dream self too so they can kind of ground you into those realms but you're absolutely true it is it's the benchmark of all these traditions and it's something that's like you know it's the background sort of noise base note of the universe it's sort of itself that and like you mentioned and especially in the western perspective even could be we're, we're pretty much desensitized towards that we lost being able to sort of hear that doesn't mean that bass note's not there it's you know it's that's that driving force of all these sort of watery currents that are kind of pulling this the firmament together you know and um so it's a beautiful thing when you can can start to it's it we're coming from similar backgrounds and traditions with that um that's why it kind of always kind of drew me in because like, you know, that dream state is the, you know, the birth of mythos and then all these archetypal energies that are there and not to get into that, that psychological rabbit hole. I'd like the archetypal imagery, but it's a matter of interpretation and that veil between subjectivity and objectivity gets very, very wonky in those dream states, which is always fun. It's interesting that we're recording this episode because uh, last night I had such a funny dream. I mm. I just got a new Apple Watch and I'm trying to figure out where all the buttons are. One thing led to another. There was Audible loaded on my on my Apple Watch and somehow it's controlling my phone and somehow I ended up with an Audible book on tape on, on all night long. <laughs> 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 one thing led to another and so the story is about a uh, it's one of the mercedes lackeys books uh, from the elemental masters series so the story is about uh, a woman who was born in india who moves to london sets up a medical practice 
but it's it's read by a woman with with an English accent, and they're talking about magic and and India throughout the course of the book. So my dream was going to uh, my roommate from high school's house in India. And I got there early, and so I was visiting this temple space. And when I finally got into the house, she was still sleeping. And so I went into the room that I normally stay in, which doesn't exist. And I, but I kept, the whole time I kept going, what keeps talking at me? Why, mm -hmm. where is it? I feel like there's some phone or something calling me. Yeah. So every place I go, and I, I keep looking for the speakers. <laughs> when I finally wake up in the morning, I'm like, because the book has been talking to me all night long and it was it's those moments when when like real in real life reality breaks into the dream reality in such a physical kind of way are always so amusing to me and i really wish at that point i had woken myself up to just turn the thing off and found and found it but maybe for the sake of this conversation we needed to talk about those crossover moments between because if the if the real world can break into your dreams that means your dreams can also break yeah. into your real world that gets that really veils. interesting oh it's really interesting and i love those concepts so much and i write them in my fiction quite a bit uh because it is this it's this fun uh intersection that that sort of happens and you can get that when that veil is thin you can really bridge those gaps and back to a little bit what you were saying earlier about these uh, these traditions and like the baseline pr preparation pretty much for that death moment and that returning to this kind of cosmic sea and you know the state of the the great dreamer and that all the universe is just being dreamed and that we are these images because if you look at it too I mean you know in real time we're you know progressing forward through through life right we have this we have this linear trajectory kind of going on. And, you know, we look up at the stars at night and think, oh, there's, you know, there's Sirius and there's Alderaan and all those kind of things. But those are all distant, distant lights. And we're looking at after images that are just gone already. And and it's dispersed just like dreams. Like when you wake up in the morning, you know, trying to like grab on and hold on and retain your dreams. Some are easier than others. Some have like that jumbled sort of mix that you know your brain's just working through <laughs> working things through <laughs> and others are like almost like visions where they have this like almost mythic epic narrative to them and they have are just layered with meaning and and they're magic they're beautiful it's like the best film you can ever see right like there's so much fun and um anyway what was i talking about <laughs> what dreams may come <laughs> mm. oh yeah so then that practice for like that ultimate ultimate moment like the universe is sort of is is here at once it's gone at once it's alive at once it's dead and this is that realm of you know traversing these uh these very mutable malleable sort of energies so those practices uh that you were doing in ceremony circles and like the the shamanic ceremonies the vi even vision work itself too it like uh, it is totally that training of that muscle because the more you kind of work with it, the, those, that neuroplasticity really helps you sort of get into that mode and framework very easy. And you, any sort of trance work, deep meditation and things like that. So then when you do go through that dream state, just listening to, and just watching also is a very, very pivotal I think Then you can start bridging those little things like looking at your hands and trying to turn up flex and, and exercise those muscles of retention so that when you wake up you do you do become aware of your dreams and you remember more but then you get more of that physical agency within the dreams going into those states of lucidity which like you have a whole nother life so you're like you're waking up again when you go to sleep so I think that's I, uh, it's powerful. I, I think that is absolutely the point. You're waking up when you go to sleep, but you're also waking up when you're awake. Yeah. And you realize that <laughs> the, uh, the brain waves that we have while we are sleeping don't go away when we wake up. Just like the stars don't go away when the sun is out. The stars are still there. It's just the sun is so bright 
it washes out the background of the stars. And when we are awake, when we are in the daytime, in our ordinary state of consciousness, the light of the mind is just so bright, it's washing out all of the awareness of those deeper states. It's just a lot louder. But you can learn to recognize that those, what those deeper states are all the time because they're still there. They haven't yeah. stopped. And, and that's kind of the point of dream work. When I t teach my magic students, I'm like, there are a few things that will help your magical spiritual practice more than anything else if you would just do them. And one of them is journaling. Anyone who wants a magical practice needs to learn journaling, especially kind of mindful journaling mm. that we talk about in my Book of Shadows program, because the benefits are enormous. They help you process. They help you be more aware of the moment. They help you be more conscious of the choices that you make. The fact that it costs you nothing, all the more reason, just get a book and a pencil and start a daily practice and see the benefits. Another thing I would put on that list is dream work. It, it costs you nothing. You have to go to sleep anyway. And the fact that we have this opportunity to connect to our dream world and our spirit bodies every single day. It's like going back to the mothership. Mm -hmm. That we don't use it shows the spiritual paucity, the spiritual lack of our modern culture that we no longer recognize. It is a central part of our lives. You know, going to sleep should be a cherished thing, not because you're so exhausted that you can't think straight. Yeah. It should be a cherished thing because you get to reunite with the divine spark within yourself. And I mean, I, I don't know about you, but from my practice as an astrologer, I have people coming up to me all the time going, oh, I, I just, I feel so disconnected. I feel like I'm, I'm here cast adrift from the cosmos. I feel like there's a wall between me and spirit and I don't know how to cross it. I'm like, okay, it's an illusion that there's a wall there. There is no wall. It's only mm -hmm. your brain that's tricking you into thinking that you're a wall. So so if you if you if you continue to believe that in your in your daily world, fine. But if you want to get around that, the the easiest way to is just to go into your dreams and recognize them for what they are. They are the fact that there is no wall there. They are not just an epiphenomenon of your daily psychology purging itself. You know, once you get past that, because mm. everyone who's starting to work with dreams will have a phase where their their psyche is just vomiting stuff that it hasn't yeah. processed yet. But once you get past that, whole new vistas open up if you're willing to do that difficult clean out part in the very right. beginning in a way that I find so compelling and magical. Yeah, it's like it's like having two lives. That's the real second life right there. <laughs> right? It really is. It's it's amazing. And, and two things real quick I want to say that like you're like it's absolutely right about like our culture not really well, we talked about this like a few episodes ago. But all that yin receptivity, rest Anything that's just not feeding that perpetual machine is considered inconsequential and a waste of time, which is absolutely ridiculous because you need that that whole return to balance. But I have a question for you. So mm -hmm. when you're uh, you mentioned journaling before as a, a great inroads to magical practice, actually a, a crucial sort of foundational piece. How do you feel about like dr like dream journals themselves? I go back personally. I go back and forth with them. Maybe just because I'm also a writer, and like when, when I wake up, I like to like use that in between time to just dive into what I'm working on or new creation things like that. But then I will go in times of doing dream journals because I think dreams are fascinating. But my thing why I stop, I don't continue the practice throughout like this linear continuity. <laughs> Is because I maybe don't know when to stop writing. <laughs> <laughs> so hours will go by me documenting every little detail of a dream. And then like, oh, there's my writing session for the morning. <laughs> I, 
I think you will find my Teachers Tribes philosophy really mm. useful. Um, my teacher was a writer as well. She's a professional writer. She was an English major. Um, and she, when she lived on the tribe, it was because she was handling all their federal grant applications. That oh, was her cool. job. So she, she was a writer. Uh, my teacher learned to write all of her dreams down. And she learned to write down all of her channeling connections with spirit because basically the tribe said, look, white people don't believe it's real unless it's written down. Period. <laughs> it's just the way their psyches work. Yeah, that's kind of true. Um, but, but the point was that for people who lived in the tribe, in a tribal culture, um, and I, of, of course, I've, I have never been on that reservation. I can't speak for the tribe. But mm. the gist was, my secondhand gist, um, that because the culture was grounded in a place that honored dreams, yeah. there were places every day where people were integrating dreams into their lives. They were talking about them with their circles. They were talking about them in ceremony. They were making art that expressed where they went in their dream world. It was a much more integrated part mm -hmm. of their lives. So for my teacher who was a writer, like, you need to write this down. And it's not it's – not the writing down bit that's important is that it's the pulling it over and anchoring it in something physical. So for what you're doing, it would be just as appropriate to pick up paint and pencils and draw something from your dreams as it would to be sit down and write it down. And now you know my great secret. <laughs> I, 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 because, because it's about honoring dreams and it's about sharing them and about sharing the wisdom of spirit because what's happening is we are all pulling in this wisdom of spirit all the time can you imagine the world we would be in if everyone shared their dreams with the people in their circle the kind of new reality we would be dreaming in together rather than feeling like we were totally isolated how much further we could get if we dreamed as a tribe or a collective or a community uh, yeah. how much faster we would get there rather than kind of just spinning around and around and yeah. not exactly knowing what anybody else was experiencing. Uh, so I, I, when I teach my students, I also say, when you are getting started, you must write them down. Because for most people who say, I don't dream, you have to get them past the, yes, you do. You, you, unless your brain is damaged, you are dreaming. And you're just not remembering that you're dreaming. So we have to build a bridge between the three-dimensional ordinary world and your dreams so you can bring them across and remember them. And again, for most people in the modern culture, writing it down is the simplest one because it's the one we are wordy, it's vaguely acceptable, and we are most familiar with it for most people. But if you're an artist like you, you have to amend that because you're already kind of in your dream world pulling stuff in anyway. And then it's like, well, you don't actually have to write it. You have to get it over here. So if that means playing music, perfect. If that means, uh, if that means making paintings, awesome. If that means creating a dramatic play, if that means telling your dream circle, all of those f fulfill the same function. It's just that a, a dream journal app on your phone is a lot easier to come by Ooh. when you're sitting on the subway and typing. <laughs> yeah, but I totally, I I but I totally get what you're saying with the. I fade in and out too. Sometimes I'm just busy and I have other things to do, and they're not as important to me. And sometimes it's essentially important to me. And it just depends on where I'm at. But if I'm working with dreams intensely for weeks at a time, the more you work with them, the more vivid they get, and they mm -hmm. seem to go on forever. And so you could write for four hours for a dream that probably took half an hour. <laughs> and it, in glorious detail, especially when you have a, a writer's state of mind that notices details like that. And that's not really practicable for most people in our, oh, my God, I have to eat lunch now. And all I've been doing is journaling about this dream that I had. And <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe, maybe I got to pay the bills in here somewhere. So I, I get it. But that's just all things in moderation. And until we can capitalize uh, dreams, <laughs> make that good currency <laughs> until you have some way to plug it in and like have it down transcribed for you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's going to be but uh, that would probably involve like being injected with microchips. And I, I don't trust any of the microchip companies well enough to do that yet. <laughs> no, I, I hear it. Wow. That was 
awesome. And there's so many things to, to respond to that. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned that about the dream work practice. I think that is super helpful, especially like you said, when, when you're starting out and, and it's always kind of, it's always kind of breaks your heart when you hear like, Oh, I don't dream. I never dream. And like, yeah, no, you do. You do. Everyone dreams. And it's back to what you were saying a little while ago too, that these states are always in flux. They're always in motion they are always happening. And like what I mentioned earlier, that base note of the universe type of thing, always there, it's always there. But you're right. That light of consciousness sort of washes it out and you have to tune into it. But a fun thing also happens when you're, you were mentioning the, uh, the importance of like with indigenous communities and in particular, this one, one tribe that your teacher, uh, worked with. But this is like, you know, it's a kind of a universal and the varying sort of degrees for a, a lot of these cultures. Um, and the kind of there is no place other than in art, uh, in writing, in fiction, in poetry, in song and those things for kind of real dreamers. I think it was Alan Moore kind of said that, like those like these artists, the writers of our culture are, are sort of our modern shamans. And that's a good way that at least we can kind of um, share these these imageries. Because I oh I don't remember who who said this. It might have been uh, uh, oh god, was it? I'll come back with her name, but also might not be the the right person who said this. But that like if you're dreaming, if you have a dream, that it's also for other people that you can share that. And, you know, and that that sort of like it's that sort of synchronistic sort of unfolding that that little tidbit that might when you share it with someone else, like will spark something out. It'll align perfectly with that that right moment in time for this person and trickle on and almost like have its own own life and and, and kind of spread. Um, but also like one thing like with our like particularly with our plant medicine circles, or I think this is really true of any kind of tight knit small community where you do kind of sync up consciousness and have a psychic link. And then you're having synchronistic dreams and it's like, it's so fun. Like you see like, Oh, Hey, you were in my dream last night. And we were kind of talking, or all dreaming about the same thing or similar themes from a, maybe a subtly, slightly different vantage and that is just pure magic to me like that is just absolutely breathtaking and revitalizing every time so it comes to a point where you know we were so connected that you know that doesn't also it doesn't matter whether you're in winnipeg or peru or new york city or uh, you know um if someone is doing that sort of heavy work like you feel it doesn't matter where you are you you're going right in with it because you're just yeah. like that neuroplasticity is there and that that psychic link is so strong and reaffirmed and um that you are kind of like going through that process yourself even if you're not and i that is like <laughs> like how amazing is that i know i i've had that experience on more than one occasion it's it's when you're in a ceremonial circle like and you're having feedback yeah. for years i mean it's so commonplace to be in ceremony and each person having us having like a very similar experience from different perspectives as you put it that you take it for granted and you forget that normal people think this is crazy because <laughs> like you are locked up in your own head but i remember the time when you know i was a couple of years in and i was i had just gone into work like work work like away from all of this but we had someone in the office who was super psychic and had no idea what was going on. And I knew, but, you know, you can't just walk up to people and say, hey, by the way, do you understand some of your problems are the fact that you are super duper open? Anyway, so he, he's like, God, I had the weirdest dream about you last night. And, and he said, oh, we were doing fill in the blank. I don't remember at this point. Mm. I said, oh, yeah. And then we did blah, 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 blah. And I, like, finished the sentence and the look on his face was like I had just somewhere between I'd hit him with a bat and I'd killed his puppy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm making, I'm making a new John Wick. Because, because he, he, he had no explanation for that. And so it's one of those moments where I just forgot. I forgot where I was. I forgot mm -hmm. who I was talking to. I didn't censor myself. It just caught me off guard. And so for me, it was a very palpable confirmation of, 
we are all in the same reality and we're all dreaming different things. And it, you don't, it's not just ceremonious workers. It does leak out past that. Oh, yeah. Um, but who knows what kind I mean, I left the workplace to a different job not long after that. Who knows what he needed? Maybe that was just his first foray into going down that direction that he now knew something was possible that wasn't or he thought I was nuts. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if you can switch that around thinking you're nuts with that when you did to reconfirm and finish that 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 dream that sentence and show that that shared sort of humanity and i think yeah i hopefully that did spark maybe to kind of go back to that love and magic of dreams itself because i think we always i i guess you know when you're young and you're a child and you're having the night the grand nightmare scenarios that can get a little 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 gnarly and scary um but those are fun. <laughs> you learn to love those too, even because they take on a different context. I think afterwards, they're like, like we were talking about last week with uh, the shadow work episode. The more you sort of look at that shadow, uh, you know, stare that serpent in the face, and uh, kind of like jump into the dark, it kind of diminishes a little bit. You're bringing, you're lighting things up a little bit more, and for me at least. Like, it feels like they have a, like a lesser sort of, um, like, you know, like, if you ever have, like, a really strong nightmare, it almost will wake you up and you feel like you have this, like, sediment over you. It's, like, really thick. It's this heavy cloud. And it just kind of puts a pall on your on your, your mind and your day, right? Like, it just lingers, you know? Um, and I feel like, you know, that still happens, but that lessens more and more that you kind of dive in and th into this kind of work and look at, look at things square on and... You know, um, but those are fascinating in themselves, too. Those are not super pleasant, but, you know, everything has this light and this dark side to it. But and they're they're completely valuable. I also learned to borrow some exercises from Yoga Nidra. I mean, there's an entire branch of yoga that's like sleep yoga mm. um, to learn how to fall asleep consciously and be aware of the transition between waking and sleeping, which also anyone could learn. Yeah. It just takes practice. Um, but once you get the hang of it, it also means you can wake yourself up from a dream. So I've also had the experience where, you know, I'm in the night moment. I really don't want to deal with this right now. <laughs> and rather than rather than, you know, change the channel to something else, I've just sort of grabbed myself by, you know, the back of my pants and just yanked myself back out. It's mm -hmm. like it's like being yanked up a well <laughs> backwards. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. And it's just like whoop out of mm -hmm. there. <laughs> um, that so, bungee cord type of thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, that all of these things, out of context, I'm sure Chris and I sound batshit. <laughs> 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 just we just do. But the fact that we have never, Chris and I have never sat in a ceremony together. Chris and I have actually never met in person. Believe yeah, it or not, yeah, it's true. You know someone for years and you see them all the time on the little Zoom link and you forget that you actually haven't seen each other in person. That we are having very similar experiences or similar enough, even having different backgrounds, knowing that there are other people having these kinds of experiences too. And so if you go, yeah, that's just you. It's not. It's not just us. And it's something that you can also have. And the powerful thing about it is that the best teachers for dreaming are the ones you're going to find in the dreams. So <laughs> all you are responsible for doing is saying, I want to do this and giving yourself the two or three or four weeks that it would take to train your brain to be able to remember your dreams. You know, on the one week side, if you're an artist and you're already used to working with your subconscious, on the four week side, if you're kind of like a brick and really don't think of these things at all. Any path is fine because everybody's unique, but just get yourself a little dream journal. And when you go to sleep at night, say, I'm going to, I'm going to remember my dreams tonight. And when you wake up in the morning, get your dream journal and write down whatever you remember. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be complicated. You can write down a title for your dream, you know, brain fog, whatever. <laughs> and maybe you only remember blue fog and nothing else. On that journal entry, you're going to write blue fog. 
and you're going to do it again the next day. And you might get blue frog and a carnival. And on the next day, you might get, you know, apples. And it doesn't matter. They'll, those first chips are just like the first little chips in the wall. And with each one, you're going to be taking out another chink and another chink until you open up the floodgates. And all you need to do is show up. And every dream study, the Stanford studies, the Harvard studies, all the rest of them say exactly the same thing. Everyone can learn. All it takes is consistency and the willingness to train your mind because your subconscious wants to help. It's like a big puppy. I mean, it's trying to be helpful. It just doesn't know how because you never gave it instructions. And give it the instruction that you want to wake up in your dreams. And as you do, the doors begin to open. Because I know, I know Chris wants to talk about dream keepers and the threshold guardians because it was in our notes for a different episode. So I'm going to like turn over the floor to talk about the dream keepers. So yes, that journal practice is phenomenal. I'm so glad you mentioned that again. But yes, <laughs> uh, dream guardians and threshold guardians. Well, I'm sorry, you said dream keepers, didn't you? That's what we called them. You know, it's a funny thing about that too, you know, from what I was thinking about when you were talking about it, is that the, those they, they appear in a lot of different ways, at least for me. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical sort of humanoid entity. You know, it could be animal guides, animal spirits that sort of come through or just been like, like, you know, those golden books, like the Akashic Records golden books that sort of happens. And I think that the more like, let's say from the context of you're starting out on this dream work sort of journey, like you're going through where you're starting to dream more and more um, and remember more of your dream we're always dreaming but you're remembering your dreams more and more um then i feel like you you reach that point where i mean you might have to go on a tangent of reoccurring dreams as well which i find are sort of like these sort of guardian sort of passages that sort of happen um at least for me like they like re when i have reoccurring dreams um sometimes they're like they pick up where they left off and like there's like this journey happening that constantly is sort of unfolding for X, Y, and Z. For me, it's different than like, say, encountering some sort of random person in a dream. You feel this palpable presence, right? Whether again, whether it's a tree uh, with these gnarly roots kind of reaching down deep in the earth or pools of water in between. And you're on this like alien world of purple skies and purple seas i mean that tree is a threshold guardian obviously it could be whatever you want to interpret it. I mean, is it the axis monday is the world tree is that cosmic tree that unites all the planes you have yggdrasil and then norse is that beautiful world tree that connects the nine worlds and that's a common theme throughout all shamanic cultures is a the world tree uh, but then also that traversing these realms uh, that we have this mutability to to go in between to go down deep into the roots and you know, go up into the heavens and now we don't have to really necessarily mean up and down in that physical context i mean it, that can be true too but it could be sideways and left and right and all around in circles and direction doesn't really matter it's just more of that the journeying to those destinations but so when we're having threshold guardians that appear, um, now obviously it depends on where you are in your sort of journey. I mean, they're they're fundamentally there to to initiate you into this whole new state of being, and those messages are really. I mean, trying to like distinguish how do you list, how do you know if it's a if it's an, a like a vital message or an important message or a threshold guardian or something random. And I feel like it's just like, you know, that inner sense of knowing is there and that this is this is something significant, um, whether, you know, also like in a dream, looking up at the sky and the star is shining and pulsing and like, you know, being these messages are sort of coming through in, in a varying, varying ways. And those are the ones that kind of like, for me, at least when you wake up, they stay with you. And you never forget them. Even if you journal or don't journal, they are there. They have reprogrammed and initiated you onto this whole new sort of 
sort of journey, which is the obviously a point of a threshold guardian. <laughs> you have to cross <laughs> the threshold guardian before you can continue. So if, for those who uh, maybe not be familiar with threshold guardians, it's a popular uh, uh, term in like uh, comparative mythology circles. And like uh, Joseph Campbell was a big fan of that on the hero's journey where you encounter on your sort of initiation that happens a like this series of steps like you encounter your guides and allies but then you always kind of there's always that first threshold that you have to sort of cross that will be the first threshold guardian and they're there to sort of test whether you can go beyond or not so they are there in your dreams um just as well in real in i almost said real life (laughs) (laughs) i i love that I, I, we learned about it slightly differently, but it's the same thing. So I, we call them dream keepers. Um, traditionally, they would have been Hayoka, hey which is trickster spirits. But really, they, oh. their job was to move you from the kind of dream, which is just your daily life replaying itself, to being on a more spiritual path. And I mean, functionally, they're shapeshifters. They can appear as anything because they're hiding in order for you to discover them which means you have to kind of call out if there's a rock sitting there, maybe it's not just a rock. Maybe it's a dream keeper and it's kind of going, will they see me here? <laughs> that, that it's always present. But that once you get to the point of your dreaming where you start to question the rocks, the trees, the, the, the people who wander in, it's kind of like, you know, angels among us. <laughs> uh, and that... The nature of dreams, how do you know the difference between when you're dreaming and when you're awake? Well, again, in the in in the indigenous version, it would be because dreams are weird. Things happen, like things are the wrong color. They are, um, you people are upside down. You can't read the writing on something. It's something that's out of the ordinary that lets you become aware that you are dreaming. And it's usually around those moments that the Hayoko are kind of hanging out. And if you can learn in your dream, it's a, it's a set of stages. You know, first you learn how to be aware of your hands, even just be aware of you that you're dreaming, that because things are a little weird, that's when you start looking around going, are the dream spirits here? Is the Hayoka here? Because if you can befriend them, if you can catch one, then you have a teacher. A teacher who can teach you how to go even further into your dream practice. And to have your own personal spiritual connection, like a guide who can initiate you on the deeper progress. I mean, how cool is that? That you can go to sleep and connect with your with your dream, your dream people that will bring you into a deeper contact with spirit than you could have ever imagined possible than just you know working with the normal three-dimensional reality and we all have that as a possibility because of our noble human nature if we would like to see it that way and that it's been taken from us in this culture by years of of reality bubble sculpting has fundamentally disempowered who we are and that's what makes me a little irritated and why i'm glad we get to have these kinds of conversations because if anybody listening to this can at least recognize that the possibility of reconnecting to spirit is there and it's as simple as asking for it and going to sleep with an open-handed expectancy we could begin to shift a lot of the stuff, a lot of the shadowed stuff that's in the world. Well, thank you so much. And also, like, I feel like that was such a lucid explanation <laughs> that I was definitely working at this this abstract realm and I was having trouble bringing that down into, into reality. But you're absolutely right. Um, just, you know, accepting that you can you can kind of go into these planes but then also that surrendering to it you know so that expectancy when you're going to sleep and like you can be encouraged and you know excited about what may come but you know that also that surrender factor 
of just letting yourself go, letting yourself, letting your, letting your mind go. Like, I don't know about anyone else there, but like, you know, going to sleep can be a struggle in our world. We have these blue light stimulations, everything's sort of going on, solar flares acting up and they, they respond in every which way and all this kind of ton of stimuli happening um, that we forget, like, like we're never really taught the proper way to breathe. Like we're just expected to know. I mean, obviously your body has its own process of breathing. We're not going to suffocate. Uh, you know, that's an automated muscle. Um, but the proper way to actually go to sleep is several, it's kind of like it's taken for granted. Uh, and then, well, you know, a lot of people have, that's where I went just now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking back to my, my Apple watch exploits. It now has a watch face <laughs> that teaches you how to breathe. See, Just that's in fantastic. case you forget, it's a, it's a mediated reminder to how to breathe, right? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, well, this is also you mentioned sleep yoga before. I mean, this is also why there were these like techniques because it's stuff that like it's taken for granted. Yeah, you don't want to like just wait till you're burnt out just to pass out of, of exhaustion. That has its merits too. And obviously, your body's going to sleep when it needs to sleep eventually. But to, to get into that practice mode where you're, you know, I mean, there's a big thing, especially for starting out, like in, this isn't true for any regime that you, that you want to do is that you start a schedule, you start a regime, you start being a little more disciplined with it, and then you can let that go, you know, eventually you need, I think discipline needs moderation too, but you have to build those channels. And I feel like the better, like the, the similar thing of like um, if you're meditating in, in the same spot over a year, it brings that psychic residue that's there, but also just like all the stimuli, all the sensory sort of things around you help you just slip into those channels. I think we talked about that with flow states a while back too, yeah. but it's a very similar thing to going to sleep, you know? The subconscious values habit. I said it's yeah. like a puppy. It, it Once it knows what to expect, it will race ahead and give you exactly that, for good or for ill. <laughs> <laughs> so if your habit is to go and watch television and have caffeine at night, yes, you are not going to be able to sleep because that's your habit. Your habit is to not sleep. And mm -hmm. whereas if your habit is to shut down at 830, because it's always 830 somewhere, uh, and, you know, read a book for 45 minutes and then turn out the lights, you're going to have a lot easier time in the habit because your subconscious knows it's time for sleep. So in my case, I just trained my dog to do this, that my dog knows when it's 830, doesn't matter what's going on. So she sits at the gate and she barks to be let into my bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I can either go and let the dog in to and if I if I don't go with her, she takes up the entire bed to herself, and there's no place for me. Or I can go lay down next to her, and we are both unconscious, which is probably good since I get up at five o'clock in the morning. Habits. Habits are important. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! And I feel like I really do feel like we, you know, we. I'm glad we had this conversation. I felt like we were able to scratch the surface of these dreams and. <laughs> But it's it's such um you know it's a valuable legacy that we all have and every everything dreams everyone dreams absolutely and... so remember that and take it into this week's experiment which you all know is coming <laughs> all you need to do is take some time to write down the dreams that you have this week because we know you're having them we know you're having them and so. If you are brave enough, then get a piece of paper or a little journal. It doesn't have to be fancy. Put it next to your bed and write down whatever you remember when you wake up in the morning. And if you don't have a lot of time, write down a few notes to give you the flavor and then come back to it when you have just a little more space and fill in some of the blanks. Um, I find it always useful to put a title in present tense so that you can re-enter the dream a little more quickly when you do that. And try to write, the, again, also write the dream itself, the account in present tense, so you can be more integrated with it. In fact, there were whole books of poetry that were written based on the titles people created for their dreams day after day after day, because you can see the patterns emerge 
over time. So do that. See what happens. And maybe you will find that even in your daytime, you are waking up a little bit more. That's really beautiful. I'm really encouraged to hear what people dream about and what they can share, especially that ongoing practice to, to, to weave together those titles. That's really cool. I haven't heard that before. I think that'll be super fun. Of course, this episode is brought to you by My Magic School. And if you're interested, why don't you check out my latest mini course, which is on how to work with the moon to unlock the magic in your own life. You can find out more about it at www.magicandmastery.com slash moon. Features two and a half hours of video, four ceremonies, and an entire workbook to teach you how to design your own rituals so that you can find ways to live in balance and harmony with life's natural rhythms. That's www.magicandmastery.com slash moon. And I know we talked about a whole ton on this episode. So again, if you want to find out about the books and things that we've referenced, you can check out the show notes. And that's at www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast. And we have all those goody show notes there for you. And you can keep track of uh, this thread a little more lucidly. <laughs> <laughs> And thus ends another episode of Magic and Mastery with me, your host, Donna Woodwell, and Chris Kaplan. If you enjoyed this episode, please, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast. That's how we know what you love, so we can bring you more of the good stuff. And if you like it, why don't you share it with a friend? <laughs> 